Hi, Tiz. Hi, it's good Kimai. to see you again. Good to see you. <laughs> okay, so I know you did your BS in aerospace uh, right. engineering at UT Austin. That's right. And you got your MS at the Tecnologico de Monterrey. Yeah. I said that correctly. Yeah, that's pretty good. In Mexico. Yeah. That was in manufacturing engineering. Yeah, that's correct. And, uh, and your PhD, I see, obviously, you just got here at yes. Rice Material Science. Firstly, like uh, where you were from originally and how you got into this field. Into this field, yeah, mm -hmm. sure. Um, I'm originally from Mexico, mm -hmm. so I grew up in Mexico my whole life. Um, up until I was 16 years old, I came here to the United States as a sophomore in high school, mm -hmm. and I came here, uh, you know, with family by myself. My parents stayed in Mexico but with other relatives that live here in the US. And I did high school, and then when I was doing high school, I started liking science and math and all, the, you know, and all that stuff, and that's where I started liking in engineering. So that's how I got into engineering in the first place. Uh, how I got into aerospace was a little bit of a, I guess, unforeseeable situation because I wanted to do mechanical engineering. Okay. And when I applied to UT Austin, uh, mechanical engineering is highly competitive. Okay. And I guess I didn't have as many qualifications as other people that got into mechanical engineering. My second choice was aerospace engineering, which is very similar to mechanical, uh, but focuses more in like into aerospace. Um, so I, my plan was to go into aerospace and then transfer into mechanical. But as I started taking the class in aerospace engineering, I was like, I, I kind of like this a little bit better than mechanical engineering. Okay, it happens for a reason. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, and and I said, okay, I'll just stay here. And I mean, honestly, you can, as an aerospace engineer, you can get a job as uh, almost as any other place a mechanical engineer can get a job. Right. Um, but then you 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 get to play with cool airplanes. And that kind of thing. That's awesome. Yeah. And so, Dr. Barrera. Um, I'm sure he was instrumental to you in the race because he kind of yeah. has that intersect on Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess after I did my undergrad, I went back to Mexico and I was working there. And while I was working, I started doing my master's. And in the research group that I, wor that I was working in, in my master's, uh, my advisor invited Dr. Barrera to come to our university down there in Mexico. I guess they knew each other already from previous uh, collaborations. I okay. Guess. okay. And and um, so he came, and my advisor asked me to present the, the work that I was doing, which I did, and he liked it. He said, "Oh, you know, I I would like that you come to if you want to to continue the, uh, working for me as a PhD student." I was like, "Okay," uh, and yeah, that's how it happened. Awesome. <laughs> that's how I came to Rice, actually. Yeah. <laughs> I love when things like that <laughs> Yeah. Connecting like that. Yeah. So what do you work on then with Dr. Barrera here? Well, here I continue, uh, when, for my master's I did, a, I did some work, uh, simulation work on carbon nanotubes mm -hmm. and uh, polymer matrix, so kind of like this. Okay. So you mix carbon nanotubes in a polymer matrix. And I did simulation work. So basically I developed a simulation to calculate the electrical conductivity mm -hmm. of like a composite material like this. And when I came, uh, Dr. Barrera was working on a project of uh, carbon nanotube wire. So he asked me to work on simulations on how to improve the properties of carbon nanotube wires, uh, which is what I did for the past four years. For the most part, that was most of my thesis work. I also did some experimental work here uh, Know, measuring the conductivity of carbon to wires and that kind of stuff. Awesome. But yeah. So was there a role model that you kind of had when you were doing your journey here? Here at Rice University, I would probably say my father. He was very, always very hardworking and very like methodical and always like doing his job, mm -hmm. uh, you know, all the time, no matter what. So I guess I just adopted that from him and from my mom, like that. Um, yeah, that culture of yeah, that culture of always doing your best, your job, your work, your best, you know, to, to the best of your abilities. Uh, yeah. Then, what are the pros and cons then, that you've experienced here, at Rice? Um, 
So the pros, definitely, I mean, you have a lot of opportunities for collaborating with a lot of smart people. Uh, you, you know, other students, other faculty that you can talk to, that you can learn from. Like, that's a lot of pros uh, that I would say that you have here at Rice. Also, you have the exposure to many uh, speakers that come here, like mm -hmm. seminar speakers and, 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 and conference speakers that you get to learn from or learn about. Uh, you also, you know, you go online, you can almost download any paper from any journal that you, that you, that you like, and if it's not available, the library will get it for you mm -hmm. and, you know, and will will notify you. Like, that, there's a lot of resources here. Um, you have the a cluster computer, um, computer cluster that you can use, that's what I use for my simulations, that you can have, you know, it has hundreds of computer nodes that you can run your simulations in parallel, like all kinds of stuff, you know, the lab, uh, the labs are great, you know, the, the characterization equipment, SEM, TEM, RAM, like you name it, you can, you can do almost anything. And I guess for a lot of people, the cons is, and for me as well, is that uh, sometimes it, 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 it requires you to, to be the, the driving force. If, if you don't have the self-motivation to, to, to do it yourself and, and learn yourself the things and to have a routine and a discipline to, to continue your work, then definitely you're gonna just not do it, you know, and, <laughs> and not get anything done, yeah. So along those lines, a lot of people that are looking at advisors, and um, there's kind of the general consensus that Dr. Burr has a lot more hands-off, you know, that you need to be more self-motivated. Yes, yes, so, for sure. Uh, was, was that a really big challenge for you, or it, it was an adjustment period for you? It was an adjustment, okay. um, yeah, but I liked the fact that he allowed me to explore, mm -hmm. you know, whatever I was interested in. He, yeah, he was really, you know, hands-off in that aspect. Um, and it was an adjustment because my previous advisor was a little, uh, a lot more hands-on, <laughs> so to speak. He was a lot more... You know, every Friday, let's meet, let's see what's your progress. Uh, it was different, obviously, because Masters is a shorter period of time, right. and you gotta do it everything quickly. So uh, PhD allows you to have more time to explore different avenues and that kind of stuff. So I, I, I liked it. I mean, I prefer, honestly, I prefer that, that, that kind of um, you know, advising rather than someone that is on top of me every, every Friday or every right. week asking me, you know, where's your problems, yeah. So did you get to try a lot of different projects? You mentioned you did most of the simulations. And yeah. You also mentioned you used a baby. Yeah. So what does this do? So, I mean, right now it doesn't have the, the computer here that, which controls it, but um, this is a, a rheometer. So it here has this cavity here where you can put uh, pellets, polymer mm -hmm. pellets, and then you can also add other things. We used to, we will add carbon nanotubes in here. And then this heats up to whatever temperature you need uh, to melt the okay. polymer. And then it has, it has a two, it has a screw actually in the middle, two screws I think, that mix, that mix the, they're mixing the, the pellets and, and whatever filler you add. So it, it helps you create uh, like a, like a composite material. Okay. With we we did this a lot. Oh, okay. Dog bone test. Yeah, we did it for mechanical properties and for electrical properties. Uh, tensile testing, then measure the electrical conductivity. Um, then uh, another colleague of ours that was doing his PhD in Mexico, he also um, used the same clay to deform it. Okay. Uh, and you use the, a, um, how do you call it, a, like a puncture. So why is that part white and this one black? Is that just part of the, are those two? It's the same plastic. Yeah, it's the same, yeah, it's the same plastic. It's just that this, this air has been stretched. So that it has so a, the polymer chains, change. yeah, the polymer chains are stretched instead of, um, cool. curved together. So yeah, so this is another project that we did. Um, and 
this was most experimental. Okay. So we did that, and the other project we did was, um, maybe, yeah, we had a carbon nanotube wire mm -hmm. that we were being that was being developed for electrical conductivity, and we worked with another company that um, they will make the carbon nanotube, and then they will, they will send it here, and then we will do the characterization. Well, purification first, characterization, SEM, Raman. Mm -hmm. Uh, sometimes TM, okay. uh, TGA, improve the conductivity. Gotcha. So, yeah. Awesome. So outside of then the lab, what do you do? Do you play sports? Do you have hobbies? Yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of stuff, <laughs> actually. Since I've been here at Rice, I've done one, two, three triathlons. Oh my gosh. I actually started doing triathlons here at, when I was here at Rice. Uh, another guy that was That's here so before, cool. Phil, he he invited me to a triathlon with him, like a sprint triathlon, and I liked it. And then ever since, I did two more uh, Olympic triathlons. Oh my goodness! Uh, Olympic distance triathlons. Yeah, it was, it, was, it was fun. And I mean, here I had the the opportunity that you know there was a pool that I could use to swim in That's and true. to All to train. Places. Yeah, like to ride my bike, run, like everything. So spent a lot of time in the gym training for those things. Also, almost every weekend, uh, my wife and I will go to the to my sister's house. She lives in the Woodlands area, oh, Woodlands okay. Congo area. Not too far. We will go to a church over there, and we will do a lot of activities with our church, like uh, you know, uh, like go and help the homeless and That's things neat. like that. And, and on Sundays, that. yeah, and on Sundays we get together to like play softball, baseball, and, or basketball, and things like that. So, so usually during the weekend we were over there, like just doing all these other activities, completely, you know, different exactly. from from our week routine. And then, you know, Sunday we come back and then get back to the routine of, you know, me researching my wife, you know, her studies and her work. So, if there was anything you wish you could have done or had time to, and money wasn't an issue, what would it be? Like, I guess I would have liked to probably attend more uh, uh, conferences. Oh, okay. So I, I attended a few, not many, but that's something that I really enjoyed doing. And I think, you know, uh, the resources here at RISE allow you maybe to go to maybe one once a year or, or, or once or twice in your, in your PhD. Uh, for the most part. So in your life in general, is there ever something that you've always wanted to do? You can still do it. Mm. <laughs> now that you're free. <laughs> now that I'm free to pursue anything. Um, <laughs> I think, I mean, I think I, honestly, I, I, you know, over the course of my life, I think I, I've always done more than I expected of myself. I don't know if that sounds, if that makes that's sense. That's good. No, that's yeah, a good like, thing. you know, I never planned to even do graduate school. Like that was I never, so. you know, I was just working. I was just, you know, doing my job, I guess. And uh, all of a sudden, the opportunity to my master's came up, and then the PhD, and here I am, you know. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm already doing more than I expected. I think that's a great thing to point out. Actually, I think a lot of people, myself included, never really expected to get as far as we yeah. went, as we did. Yeah. And um, and a lot of people do know exactly. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I know I want to go get a PhD, and, yeah. but a lot of people don't, and so I think it's great because, you know, a prime example of um, being able to find your way even if you didn't know exactly what you yeah. wanted to do in the very yeah. beginning. So if you're content, you know, happy where you are at the moment, then whatever comes after that, then it's already a plus, right? You're already like, wow, I wasn't even expecting it. I was happy just to, you know, have a job, do this, do that. Mm -hmm. And then more things come your way, you're like, well, this is even more, this is even better, you know? And so that's kind of how I, f I feel. You know? More things come my way, excellent, you know? Awesome. Nothing comes my way, I'm already good where I am, you know? Oh, that's you a know? great thing. Yeah. To be content with what you have, but every extra thing is a good thing. Yeah, exactly. So what is next for you then? So yeah, so right now, um, right now I'm kind of in the market uh, interviewing for some uh, for some jobs. I really, I mean, I really enjoy research. Uh, 
and that's kind of a goal that I that I have to continue to do research in one way or another. I guess I don't have my mindset in whether it's academia or industry. I think both areas have their pros and cons, you know. And also, I would like to get a little bit more involved with not just research, but a little bit more in development, where I can, you know, develop a product, develop a service, a, a methodology, something that that. Um, that would be useful in a sense, uh, or that, or that I can, I can, you know, grasp myself and say I, I, I made this rather than just, you know, I studied this. You know? Right. So just kind of move that research a little bit more further down the, the chain and, and get it into a product. So That's awesome. Well, it makes sense that you chose Dr. Barrera. Yep. He's a very attractive advisor for that reason. Yeah. Right exactly. Sure. Yeah. He, he always does that intersection. Yeah, he always pushed me into like, you know, what does that mean? <laughs> you know, like great simulations, great results, but what does it mean in a more practical sense? You know, what is it what is new about your research? Uh, what is the practical part of it and how could it be applied to, to you know to real life application rather than just you know, keep it as a as a cool result that you got. So, so I was told he had, uh, when he taught his class actually, okay. that his questions are framed in the same kind of mindset. Okay. So it's not just, you know, your theoretical um, prediction or whatever models that you have for things, but how this actually could work in real yeah. life. And I think that was a great thing for a lot of the students. And sometimes I think, um, like, pure theorists sometimes lose sight of yeah. uh, the end goal, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I guess. I guess I have never considered myself a pure theorist, and before I came to RISE, I had never separated the two. When I came here, uh, right off the bat, people asked me whether I was experimentalist or theorist, and I never thought about it in that. I never, I never separated the two. I always thought, what, why should they be separate? You know, and. Um, there's a good saying, I remember the author that says there's nothing more practical than a good theory, you know, and, and if you don't, you gotta have the theory in order to do practical things with it. And, and if you just leave it as a theory, like you say, you may lose sight of, you know, what can be, what are the good applications of it. If you only do experiments and never think about, you know, what are the theoretical, the physics of, of your experiment, what's happening, then just you're just shooting darts, you know, in the dark. Like maybe I'll get this, this awesome <laughs> yeah. material from my furnace, you know. Maybe I won. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> but you gotta you gotta apply theory to experiment in yeah. a sense. So, I mean, I think it's yeah. I think experimentalists are a little bit more exper experiment and less theory. And the theor theories should be a little bit more theory than experiment. But th you should never separate the two. I think that's a good thing. I think that's also why material science and engineering in general is a cool field because mm -hmm. it in incorporates, it tries to at least, yeah. incorporate the fundamental and the applied side of engineering. Okay. So a lot of the people that read my blog are undergrads and um, they are at that cusp where they're trying to decide between grad school and industry but they don't know what to do. Do you have any advice you give them? Yes. Yeah, so. Uh, when when I graduated from undergrad, I didn't go into grad school because I didn't really think that was that was what I wanted, and I had no idea what what grad school was about, and I didn't know what kind of field I would like or what kind of research I would enjoy. So that's why I went to work in industry. Once I was there, I realized you know what was what were the things that that I didn't know basically. And what field interests me the most, um, uh, and what were the skills, abilities I needed to acquire in order to be able to do my my job uh, um, better. So that's why I decided to go into into grad school, masters, and then PhD. So I will give the same advice to to any undergrads that are unsure about whether they should go into a PhD or grad school in general, is to go into industry, go work, figure out what you like doing. If you have already the abilities to do that job with your undergrad, mm -hmm. then just stay there, you know, and, and do that for the rest of your life. You'll be good, you know. But if you say, um, if you realize, no, I need to n learn new things in order to do that job that I really, really want or that I really enjoy, 
then go back to into grad school and just you know and learn learn those things and then go back to industry and, and apply them. Right? Yeah. So yeah, that, that's kind of, that has been my um, my mentality. Okay. So that's that's my intent after I've, now that I'm done with my PhD. Awesome. Okay. So last question, silly question. Okay. If you were frozen cryogenically for a hundred years and you came back to life. What would be the first thing you'd ask? <laughs> um, number one, do we have flying cars yet? And where can I buy one? Uh, Tesla. Probably. Yeah, probably Tesla brand still around. Uh, number two, have we found the cure for cancer? It's a good one. And good one. and what is it? Um, number three, uh, I would just I would just be interested in what had happened the last hundred years, like. How many wars we went in? Who was oh the goodness. president? Uh, did Donald Trump's son became president after him? Um, you know, are, is Mexico still around? I don't know. Maybe oh, some country invaded it, and oh, we're <laughs> you know we are no longer around or whatever. But yeah, I guess that would be my that would be my curiosity. That's a really good answer. Good fun answer. All right. Well, thanks, Matias. Good Thank luck you, with your life. Thank you.